and welcome to another segment of Appetizers for Success. Today's topic will be our journey from the corporate world to executive coaching. My name is John Arnold. I've been doing this work for a long time, 25 plus years, work with hundreds of leaders and dozens of companies worldwide. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, Mary Elena Beusis. Hi, John, nice to see you again. Today's topic is one that is very dear to our hearts. Um, and I think something that our audience here listening to us today will um, just enjoy because it's about our story, our journey as executives and then becoming an executive coach. How in the world do we get into this, right? So why did you get started? You know, how, how do you start it, John? You know, it, I, I get asked that question, Marilena, by almost every leader and individual that I work with, uh, every company that I work with. And so my journey came from financial services. Uh, I was in the financial services industry for quite a while. And, and one thing that became painfully obvious to me was I was able to experience some really great leaders. And I was also really fortunate to experience some really poor leaders. And while I didn't have an official coach or mentor, there was one leader, her, I'll just use her name, Alex, who was probably one of the most influential people in my corporate life. And the journey to executive coaching was almost happenstance. My last financial services position gave me the opportunity to work with someone who was brilliant. And when she ended up retiring and leaving that company, she reached out to me and said, you know, there's something about your style. I would really enjoy playing with you. Would you like to start a coaching, uh, a consulting company? I said, sure. So we embarked on the journey of doing some mission, vision work. We started to do some strategic planning work. And then quite honestly, we found ourselves being asked by leaders, could you, could you guys create some kind of a coaching program for us? Mm -hmm. And that's how my career was launched back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And we began to customize our own coaching work that was tailored to the organizations and the leaders we were coaching. Hmm, fascinating. Just like you, I was an executive in a multinational uh, financial service organization. Um, I was very challenged by that last job that I had. Um, I was the vice president of human resources for a multinational, and I had to cover 15 different countries, 7,000 employees mm. under this particular regional director, and I was his HR business partner. And I was truly a business partner because in my concept, I had to look everything from budgeting, planning, forecasting, downsizing, um, you know, investigations of fraud um, and things like that. And every time something, you know, there were more, uh, even though I was in HR, there was more about the company and the results of the company and less about the people, including mm -hmm. me in that mm -hmm. HR position. So that really struck a chord. One, one time, one of my employees said, well, if you are the HR VP, you know, how come your door is closed most of the time? And so that, for me, that and many other uh, things that I could, could tell you kind of struck a chord and said, what am I doing here, right? And then on top of that, you know, my personal life was very, very challenged. I was bringing my parents from Venezuela. I was sponsoring them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the company wanted to send me to London or Singapore. And I said, stop. You know, I'm not going to sacrifice anymore in my executive career preference for the huge success I was having because I was very wildly successful. Um, and then leave my family behind now that I had an opportunity for them to be with me and have a better quality of life. Not, not to mention that I couldn't keep a boyfriend at the time because I was always on a plane. <laughs> and so, you know, those sacrifices and trade-offs that we all make, you know, with kids, no kids, you know, with health issues and so on. Um, and so I, I did resign. Um, and, but I was clever about my resignation. Uh, there's two things that happened before I resigned. One was my boss, just like your mentor, he encouraged me to start studying coaching because I told him about, I discovered coaching through a consultant friend of mine. I went to the first ICF conference in Vancouver or, or third or something it was very new. Mm -hmm. And 
for me, it was like, how can I equip myself as an VPA or HR to better uh, develop the leaders in that organization? Of course, I made a claim that I wanted to become an internal coach, but they decided, no, I was too expensive. I was a VPO HR. They didn't know what coaching was, what it could do for an organization, and they decided not to. But I also want to highlight that during that transition, I did hire a coach. Hmm. Someone who was certified, um, an MCC, a master certified coach, incredible person. But here's the one thing, and maybe with this, I'll ask uh, you the, this, the next question. She didn't get me, John. She didn't get my executive background, what I was wrestling with, um, you know, how can be more effective as an executive, even less that I wanted to make a transition from being an executive to becoming an executive coach. She just was not an executive coach. She just didn't get me at all. So I guess the question that I have is, you know, what guarantees us success, you know, as executive coaches? What are differentiators um, that you have found, not only for yourself, but also for other executive coaches that have partnered with us and that we can get our audience to know how to go for a great executive coach. What are some of those attributes? <laughs> what a great question. I want to go back to a little bit in my journey, then I'll come to your question. You know, I had the, I had the good fortune uh, or my curiosity took me to a linkage conference up in the DC area back in the early 2000s. And I had the opportunity to meet with some of the Ken Blanchard company folks. Mm -hmm. And they were fascinating. Um, they were curious about me as well. And, you know, the Blanchard organization was one of the first, if not the first organization that I contracted with as an executive coach and consultant. And I've had the, the amazing fortune to work with a number of other great coaching organizations. Um, and, and I've learned, I learn we both do. We both, you and I both learn from every individual or leader that we work with in every coaching session. And so um, it took me a while to embrace coaching certification, quite honestly, and you know that. Um, it took me a, an awful long time to embrace that. I wasn't, I wasn't aligned with some of the coaching certification that was happening way back when, but I am proud to say that I am a, an ICF certified professional coach now and will continue to um, educate myself down that path. And I think that gives us, or I know that that gives us um, some credibility in the work that we do. Plus you and I have the benefit of the corporate background with, which gives us some of the street cred we require to work with the leaders that we work with at the highest levels of an organization. So I think when it comes to seeking an executive coach, leaders or individuals are looking for some level of credibility. Oftentimes, my uh, corporate background gives me an edge. Uh, I think referrals, you and I are both blessed to or very fortunate to receive referrals. And there are some recommendations on our respective LinkedIn pages that give us additional credibility when it comes to this work. And I think that you and I are at the level now where when we do our chemistry calls, and, and for those who are not familiar with a chemistry call is, if you're looking for a coach, if you're looking for an executive coach, a really top shelf executive coach, well, you should talk to two or three and, and get a sense for how they work, what their style is, because chemistry in this work is absolutely fundamentally important. So um, if you're looking for a great executive coach, talk to a few, educate yourself about their style and their process, because um, the work itself is intimate. It's powerful, and the, the contract that we create between the executive coach and the leaders we're working with is, is a wonderful roadmap that gives them a, an incredible journey to be successful in the coaching process. Yeah, well said, John. I, I do also agree, you know, when I started executive coaching and becoming a coach, actually, um, I went to Coach U at the time because Coach U was virtual. Now they're all virtual schools. And I was still an executive. So it took me two and a half years just to get an accreditation just because I was still working as an executive, doing it at night or the weekend. And it's not just about taking the courses, John. You and I know that even the best schools, I mean, I know people that graduated from some elite schools around the world that it's not because of the title. It's because of the proficiency 
of the skill sets that they have. Um, you know, the ICF, I was one of the founders of the Spanish People Network worldwide, mm -hmm. just right. because every time, because I, I work in the Latin American region and every time I would go, I would take advantage and meet with some of these coaches, hoping to find executive coaches in Latin America for my leaders in those countries. And there were not, there was a lot of coaches, uh, coaches, mm -hmm. sorry, um, in Latin America, uh, the, some good schools, but they weren't executive coaches. They were more uh, personal and life coaches. Um, and so in that quest, I said, well, I got to do something about it. I had to elevate uh, the level of consciousness of what executive coaching is. So, you know, kind of a trailblazer, you know me, I go and pioneer, you know, yeah, going to know places that. that nobody else has done and get myself in trouble for that too. Um, but, you know, and then doing work with and contracting with some of my clients, just also helping them understand the value of this. And also that I don't have to explain executive coaching. I have to demonstrate, right. you know, just like you do, what an executive, you know, what is a higher uh, level of performance and of optimization of self and the business and how they conduct their business and their teams, you know, it's, it's a calling for me to call for the impact that they can only have for other people as well as, in my case, even at some country level. Mm -hmm. These are executives that have so much power, um, just some of them personal power, but some of them power that the organization can give us so they can either make or break sometimes even a country. And so, you know, for me, when I'm in their presence, I'm in awe of, first of all, how smart they are. And second of all, how sometimes they don't realize that power that they can have to transform lives themselves and that of others. Yeah, that's great. The, the, power, the, the power piece that you just referred to is so critical. I mean, you and I both know in our work that if we're working with leaders at fairly high levels in an organization, that it can be pretty lonely at the top. Yes, they have members of their teams, they might have their general counsel, they might have their spouse or life partner or someone in their uh, sphere of influence that they would be talking to, but we, we, get, we have the privilege of creating the most safe container for them to do this, this work and have these conversations, especially during the current environment, you know, the current political environment, the current economical environment, the current um, environment with the pandemic. I mean, we, we have the, the privilege to be in conversations with leaders that are struggling with, with events that they could never have planned for, never have, never have foreseen that these events were going to happen. You know, and in our future conversations, we'll be talking to new, to to certain leaders about, you know, what are they doing with the current strategic plan? How are they modifying that? You know, what are they what are they doing different as a leader to lead differently? What kind of conversations are they having with their teams or even there down into the organizations across the organization with employees? You know, what are they how are they experiencing remote workplaces? So, you know, you and I and our our other peer coaches are being presented with an incredible opportunity to work with leaders and, and, and help get them through these most diff difficult times. And what an honor and a privilege it is for us to do that. It is, it is. And, you know, I think the best organizations that we're working right now and some of the best leaders, they do recognize that they cannot do it alone. Hell no, I did not. You know, when I started my work in the United States as an immigrant, as an expat, working for a multinational, I knew what I knew, right? It's a lot of content and concepts, you know, MBA, whatever you want. But the life wisdom, you know, where I was going to get that, mm -hmm. you know, who was going to be my role model? Who was going to make me reflect, you know, my anxieties, my tribulations, my sometimes I don't know. And not able to say that out loud sometimes. I was, I was able, sons got to say it to my mentor boss. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely helpful, but not a lot of people have that privilege of working with someone that they can be so vulnerable. So that vulnerability of the executive that is trying to make it, not break it, uh, that's what we deal with. And it's dear to us, is in, a, in a, an environment that is a privilege, it's of extreme confidentiality. And you're absolutely right about the chemistry. There's a lot of people that, even though 
they need a coach, I might not be a coach. And, and being that space of clarity for ourselves as coaches to say, yes, I'll, I'll pass you along to somebody else that will be a better coach than I will for you. It's, it just doesn't feel right. You know, I just hate the fact that, you know, even in our coaching arena and with some of our peers, well, first of all, they're not able to see that because they're so right. hungry for work. Right, right. And, and it's, just, it's horrible. Sometimes I walk in organizations where coaching has a bad rap because they just didn't have the right uh, coaching engagement or the right coaches. Uh, the other thing that can happen is organization, especially the admin part of contracting, either procurement, HR, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. they just don't know. They just go for, I don't know, the pricing scheme or whatever it might be, whatever it's easier for them to administer rather than caring about who might be that best coach. I've been in a situation in what I've been one of those one, two, three that you mentioned, the three, so that they can select the one coach. And I know already the HR was buddy buddy with somebody else. So <laughs> let's start being honest. Right. You know, and if you know that's the best person for your executive, don't go to the presentation of the three coaches. Give them the option by just say who who you prefer or who you have worked with or what are the results. So I'll encourage our audience that out there interviewing coaches. Also, I do this. I give my references to people that might be in similar situations or were in similar situations that are able to talk about what their coaching experience was. Not about me or you, it's about their own journey and how much do they gain from that and just have them talk. And sometimes that connection, even if they don't choose me as a coach, it just brings you another pair of ears, someone else to talk to. They are in journeys, leadership journeys that are similar and that they can be good companions, um, you know, alongside that journey. You know what? I'm 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 smiling at because I love your stories. Obviously, <clears throat> the other thing that we get to experience, our work is about building relationships, right? Very, 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 very tight uh, uh, relationships. And I, I have a former client that I worked with back in 2015 reached out to me three months ago, and we just reengaged. Uh, the experience that we had together, and I say we because it is about that experience that the coachee and the coach has together, was one that he wanted to experience again in his new leadership role. The other thing is, and I know you know this to be true, is I, you know, we, we, will, we will hear from people that we might have coached 10 or 15 or 20 years ago who just check in with us to say, I just wanted to let you know what I'm doing, or I wanted to give you an update on my family because, I, you know, when I when I start coaching, working with someone, I let them know that the work we will do together will impact every aspect of their life, their health and well-being, their professional life and their personal life. It, it, it's, it, is, it is going to happen 99% of the time because of the behavioral shift that they make that takes place in the work that we do together. So the other thing that I, that I enjoy sometimes is the personal notes. Uh, that I receive, uh, words of thanks that really touch my heart, uh, and even some cases, some kind of crazy gifts like frying pans and flip-flops, depending on the organization you get to work with, which are uh, fascinating for me. So the fact that we are able to impact uh, every aspect of an individual's life, personally and professionally, is just, it's just wonderful. And we are so fortunate to be able to do this great work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I remember one time, and this is when I was in my very early uh, years of coaching. I've been coaching now for 19 years. And um, uh, I was, it was December 30th, and I get a phone call from this regional director, and he was meeting with his whole regional team, 12 of them. And they called me on a conference call just to tell me how successful they have been. And they wanted to call me and thank me because I was part of that success. I never saw it coming. Like our experience working with them gets them to places and results. Not that they couldn't do it alone, but certainly we were catalyzers for them to achieve those results in a way that was not as hard or inimaginable or even more efficient. So I think when we're talking about executive coaching and how to measure success of your coaches, 
it is a part of what you just described, you know, your own personal experience of going through the process, but it's also about what are the results and they call this ROI or coaching. And there mm-hmm. are people that are wonderful about measuring this. I think it's important to ask about that um, as well, because this is not a, you know, I remember my first coach, this is, I'm in the happy business. Well, no, we're not here to make you happy. Sorry. We're here to put you to the grin of what it is in life. You know, the reflections, they, you know, make it happen that, you know, stop thinking about this over and over again and spinning your wheels, but making it happen in a way that is true to you and mm-hmm. is true to the, your values and true to the values of your company. So I think when people are starting to interview uh, coaches, they should also ask for what kind of result have you achieved? And it's not about the coach, but with your clients. And lastly, for me, for today, I also wanted to tell our audience about certain risk with coaches are already certified and yes, they prove results. And it's going down the path of negotiating with them in lower prices. Lower prices will get you the dollar store. Okay, yes, there are coaches out there that are desperate, especially in times of crisis. I'm the one that if you have a value, you should pay for that value because who knows what you're gonna get out there. I got away and I think you did John, as you as well, we got away from the hourly model. You know, how are you going to count the value of this transformational work that you're about to engage? Are you going to measure that in hours? It's like measuring your worth as an executive just on your base salary. It's way more than that. So, you know, I would like for our audience to think about that next time they want to hire a coach for themselves or for their organization. What is the value? Start with that conversation first. Yeah, that's great because we we have, you know, it's been 10 or 15 years, I think, since we moved away from an hourly model. <clears throat> and to your point, when you're working with a leader, what's the value of taking that leader to that next level, to the organization, to their team, to the to the employees that they that they lead in, in total, total value to the organization. So you bring up a great point. You know, and as we close out, um, Today, I, I want to encourage people when you're looking for an executive coach, do your homework. Ask hard questions. I welcome the question Have you ever been fired? Well, yeah, I've been fired. Have you ever fired an, a, a coachee? Yes, I have fired a coachee. So ask the hard questions. Ask the questions about their style. Ask the questions about what should I expect from working with an executive coach. To Marilena's point, there isn't an ROI that says, I'm going to increase your uh, bottom line by your personal bottom line by 20%. But we will increase your influential and, and inspiring leadership across the organization by the great work we'll do together. So we invite you to tune in. Topics coming up in future conversations for appetizers to success will involve asking some leaders that we'll be working with, both in the business community, not for profit, and religious community, some of the th- really big challenges that they're facing now, moving through 2020 into 2021.